get started with our study this evening. Thank you for joining me. You know, every night, by God's grace, five nights a week, we're going to be opening the Bible. We're going to study. We're going to challenge ourselves to grow. We are particularly right now beginning Daniel chapter four. And I'm going to try something new today that I have not tried before. So we'll see how that that goes in a moment here. And um, but before we do that, you know that I'm not smart enough to teach anything. So <laughs> let's have a word of prayer and ask God to be our teacher this evening. Now, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for not giving us what we deserve, but giving us what your dear son does. As we're about to open our Bibles this evening, Father, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which is the only effectual teacher of truth. We ask this, Father, not because we are worthy, for we are far from worthy. But we ask this because your son has told us to come boldly before this throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and pardon in time of need. And Father, there is no question that we are in a time of need. So please come near to us. Grant us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the only effectual teacher of truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, very good. My friends, it is so nice to be with you this evening. I have been laboring over this passage. It's funny because these stories that are in the book of Daniel do seem very simple, and they are actually quite simple. I'm not going to try to make it more complicated than what it is, but there are some very wonderful principles that if we grab hold of them, we would be better persons even in this present world. And so I want to begin in Daniel 4. And I'm not going to do a review like we did last time. We reviewed Daniel 1, Daniel 2, Daniel 3. We're going to just going to jump right into Daniel 4. And as we're jumping into Daniel 4, I want you to be intelligent. Uh, we, we need to be intelligent when we look at the scriptures. And we're not looking for necessarily deep things as we're looking for that which is obvious there. And sometimes when we look at the obvious, the deep thing presents itself, right? So the Holy Spirit is the teacher. He will actually guide us into the truths that are necessary for our heart salvation. So we're not interested in just information for information's sake, but we are literally interested in scripture so that we can be transformed. So that's what I want to make sure everyone has in mind as we are studying the word of God. Now, just a, a couple of house items. If you are listening to this on Facebook, please, you know, start a watch party, share with someone else. And I'm not saying that for you to promote me as it is the truth needs to be presented as often and as frequently as possible. So if you could share this with as many people as possible, that would be wonderful. The other thing I want to make sure that everyone is aware of, most of the uh, recordings, the audio recordings are on our podcasts. You can find our podcast on Podbean. You can find it on iTunes. You can find it on Spotify and these other, many of the other uh, podcast areas. So you can find those there. We have the presentations from what we do nightly here, and we also have presentations that I've done in the past on those podcasts. So if you would like to download those, feel free to do that. And also the lesson guides, which I will be sending out tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. If you are listening on Facebook, then you don't get these on a regular basis. So if you would like to receive the lesson guides and you're listening on Facebook, you need to send me your email with your first and last name. You can direct message that to me in my, you know, in my DMs, and I will put your name in the registry so that you can receive the email going out tomorrow morning. And those lesson guides go all the way from Daniel one to Daniel <clears throat> to Daniel four uh, tomorrow, and then they have the other lessons that we've been covering regarding um, true education, gospel gospelpreneurship. And we're developing the ones for relationship. I haven't quite fully developed those, but we're developing the, the love and marriage ones as well. So if you would like to receive those, no cost to anybody, just feel free to first and last name and your email address in my direct message, and I will get that to you. Do not put it in the live stream of the videos. So put it directly in the direct message. Those of you who are watching via webinar, you already got everything locked in, so you're good to go. All right, so we're ready to study our Bibles. We're opening now to Daniel chapter 4, and I just want to pray one more time since 
we did just have a little commercial, if you will. Uh, let's just pray once more before we begin our study this evening. Father in heaven, again, we just ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit that we may understand your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Daniel 4, and we're looking at verse number 1. And pay close attention to the passage. Uh, it's very simple, but it starts out by saying, Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, my friends, this would be a very... I mean, if you read it and just read it through, you'll, it, it will be something that you would just pass over. But I don't want you to pass over this. The writer of Daniel chapter 4 is not Daniel. It's not Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The writer of Daniel chapter 4 is King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Did you get that? King Nebuchadnezzar himself is writing in the book of Daniel. And it need, we need to pay attention to this because... In, uh, in all the writings in the book of Daniel, this chapter, particularly written by this king in his in his language, writes to us and says, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations and languages. And you're going to see that this actually applies very specifically to us in these days. It says, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, peace. Where does peace come from? Peace comes from the gospel. Peace comes from understanding the everlasting gospel. So he's saying, peace be unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders. I thought it great to show you the signs and wonders that the high God have wrought toward me. Powerful. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, my friends, if you're paying attention to anything in regards to the book of Daniel, you'll know that in Daniel chapter 1, uh, Daniel and his friends are faithful to God, and they're representing God faithfully and standing firm regarding their diets, right? Regarding their, their lifestyle. They're standing firm to God. In Daniel chapter 2, the king has a dream. This image, rock cut, rock cut out without hand strikes the image at the feet. And Daniel tells him that this kingdom, that is the rock that strikes the image at the feet, grows into a great mountain. That's what it says. And this mountain fills the whole earth. And in Daniel 2, the, in, the, in verses 44 and 45, it lays out the reality that this is an everlasting kingdom. You guys follow that? So to me, that's profound, right? So to me, this is saying here progressively from Daniel 1 to Daniel 2 to Daniel 3. Now in Daniel 4, the king himself is saying what Daniel told him in Daniel chapter 2. There is a change that has come upon this man. The question is, what gravity had to be done in order for this king to come to this reality that there is this God in heaven who sets up this everlasting kingdom? I'm telling you, my friends, when you read when we read through this chapter, you're going to see God had to do extraordinary, super, super duper, amazing things that God had to do for him to bring him to conversion. Now, watch this now. Watch carefully. It says, verse 1, verse 4, I'm sorry. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. All right? So he's, at, he's, at, he's tranquil. He's, he's all good. Okay? I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Now, this is nothing new. We know that he was troubled in Daniel 2. Now he's troubled in Daniel 4. Notice what else it says. Therefore, I made a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Now, pause for a moment. If anyone remembers, if anyone remembers that's listening online now, that's in the webinar or wherever you are. Do you remember why God gives dreams? If you remember why God gives dreams, just type in the one or two words of why God gives dreams 
particularly. If you remember, if you don't remember, that's fine. I'm going to share with you anyway. But if you remember why God gives dreams, particularly from the book of Job, we're going to go there. Let's go to Job. If you remember, type it in. If you don't remember, it's all right. I'm going to share with you anyway. Here we go. Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33. And we're reading now at verse number 14. Now watch why the Bible says God often gives dreams. Now this is not the only reason, but this is one of the main reasons. Watch what it says. In Job 33, and beginning at verse 14, the Bible says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice. Yet man perceiveth it not. Hmm. Hold on one second here. Yet man perceiveth it not. Da, da, da. No, I don't want to share. Okay. Yet man perceiveth it not. In a vision... Or in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. Hmm. So when man goes to sleep, God gives him a dream to do what? To seal his instruction. Then it says that he may withdraw man from his purpose. Pay attention. And hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So sometimes God gives visions and dreams with the intent that he would hide pride from men, that he would keep him from the pit, that he won't make these crazy mistakes that are made in our present world, all right? So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind because sometimes, my friends, when we have dreams, we dismiss them. Now, I'm not saying that if you ate late at night and you had a dream, that means anything. Sometimes Ecclesiastes says that sometimes dreams come from a multiplicity, a multitude of thoughts, okay? So not every dream has a meaning. But in this instance, in this case, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream, and I believe, and you'll see as we read through, that God gives him the dream to hide pride from him, to reveal to him the reality of his person and of his character, okay? Now watch carefully. Watch. Let's go a little bit further with this. Let me go back to Daniel. Daniel 4. Watch what it says. So he brings in the Chaldeans and magicians, soothsayers. He brings on all these wise men, just like Daniel 2. Just like Daniel 2. Watch what else happens. It says, verse, verse number eight. And I love verse eight because verse eight is actually quite telling. Verse eight is actually quite telling. Notice what it says. But at the last, Daniel came in before me. So in other words, everybody had a chance to go first. All the other wise men went first. Nobody could give a satisfactory answer. No one came in with some deep, profound revelation from God. But Daniel, at the last, came in. Now watch. Whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying. Now before I get to all of that, I want you to notice something about King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar noticed something special about Daniel, but you know how he says it. He says the spirit of the holy gods. So he doesn't have full knowledge yet. But what he's recognizing in Daniel is something I want to share with you. And I'm going to, let me see if I can pull this up for myself. It's something I want to share with you. Yeah, here it is. Nope, here it is. Yes. All right. So. I want you to see this. I want you to open your Bibles. I want you to go with me to Daniel 1, verse 17 and 20. All right? Daniel 1, verses 17 and 20. Notice carefully, because what we're doing, we're recognizing there's a recognition that Daniel has the spirit of the holy gods in him. Okay? Verse 17 says, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding 
in all visions and dreams. You guys see that? So Daniel has, because he's faithful, because his friends are faithful, God gives them wisdom beyond the normality. He gives them understanding. Now watch verse 20. Verse 20 says, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians. You guys see that? So there it is again. This idea is very simple. Daniel and his friends are being honored of God with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge. Why? Because they have been faithful. Watch this. Daniel 2. Go to verse 14. Daniel 2 and verse 14. And I'm, sh I'm sharing these phrases with you. Wisdom, understanding. Watch verse 14. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. What did he answer? What did he answer with? He answered with counsel and uh, wisdom. Go back to Daniel chapter four. Look at Daniel four. And I want to again pay attention to these detailed commentaries. Daniel four, verse eight. Again, the Bible says, but at the last. Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and before whom I told the dream. Watch. O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret trouble of thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. You guys see that? The king, again, acknowledging to his face, telling him the spirits of the holy gods is inside of you. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 of chapter 4. Daniel 4, verse 18. Watch this. Daniel 4, verse 18. The Bible says, this dream, O oh, this dream, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able. Why? For the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. You guys see that? Watch this. Go to Daniel 5. Daniel 5, look at verses 11 and verse 12. And I'm, I'm showing you a pattern, okay? I'm showing you a pattern. I want you to see this pattern clearly. Daniel 5. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king I say thy father, made masters of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts was found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. You guys see that? Look at verse 14. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. You guys see that? Here, here it is that these pagan rulers are acknowledging that in this man, there is something special residing in him. You know, for a time, now if, you, if you've ever, I've been listening to Daniel's Revelation seminars my, nearly my whole life. I, Pretty much. And I've never heard anybody really emphasize that Daniel was a spirit filled man. Do you guys do you guys see that throughout his experience as he's in the court, there's a recognition of something divine happening inside of this man. He's no ordinary man. He is spirit filled. They don't know what to call it. They just say the spirits of the holy gods is in him. Look at Daniel chapter six. It keeps going. In Daniel 6, look at what it says in verse 3. The Bible says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king 
thought to set him over the whole realm. You guys see it? From Daniel 1 to Daniel 2 to Daniel 4 to Daniel 5 to Daniel 6, there's a recognition of wisdom and understanding. There's a recognition of counsel. There's a recognition of the, the influence of the spirit of God upon this man. Daniel is a praying man and Daniel is a spirit filled man. This is the type of person that we are to be as we are living in the final hours of earth's history and the world is looking for answers where there are no answers provided by man. Does everybody follow that? God is looking for spirit-filled individuals, spirit-filled persons who would rather die than to break their relationship with God. Now, I want to take this a tad bit further. I want, I want to make sure I anchor this point well. I would like you to go with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, and we're going to chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And this actually is going to be something that you want to keep in your notes, because we haven't started studying Revelation together yet. We will as the months go by, but right now we're just in Daniel. And so in, in Isaiah chapter 11, something interesting is transpiring in Isaiah 11, okay? And I'm going to try to do my, my new thing that I have not done before in a few moments. But for now, stay with me in Isaiah chapter 11 and look at what your Bible says. The Bible says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, it says the spirit of the Lord. So it's singular. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, watch what it does. It says the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. That's four things. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You guys see that? So here... The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Those six things. But do you notice that counsel, wisdom, understanding are all, all manifestations of God's spirit upon, upon uh, the person that's being mentioned here in Isaiah 11? And so when you see that manifestation and you look at Daniel and it says that he was wise and he had understanding and that he had counsel, that is a manifestation of God's spirit upon the man. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 11, it's referencing the person of Jesus, okay? It's referencing the person of Jesus particularly. And there's one other key component of the spirit that is mentioned here, and I'll read it, and then I'll prove it again in another section. It says, I'll read verse 2 again. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Those are six things. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not, watch the word, judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, this passage, who is the root and offspring? Who is the root and branch of Jesse? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is this person that has the spirit of God upon him. OK, and he has the spirit of wisdom, of counsel of might, of, un of understanding, of the fear of the Lord, the knowledge. And ultimately, he has the spirit of judgment. That's the, the apex of the seven. I'm going to draw here for, for you in a moment. Go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. And we're looking at verse number 4. And hopefully, my friends, you don't mind studying your Bible because that's what I like to do. I love to study the Bible. I love to, to dig in and see what it has to say, Okay. So Isaiah chapter four, look at verse number four. Notice what the Bible says. It says, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of, what's it say? Judgment and by the spirit of 
burning. In other words, the spirit of judgment and burning is the same. They are, they are, they are penetrating and purifying in the process of judgment. Okay. So let me draw it for you. Let me see if this works. I am going to try to do something I have not done before. So hopefully this is working. Let me see. Yes. So you should see a white screen and I'm going to try to draw on this screen. We'll see if it works. <laughs> if it works, guys, I'm going to have so much fun going forward because I love usually if I'm teaching, I have to have a whiteboard because it just helps me think better. OK, so what's happening in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11 is what I call a, it's a chiastic structure taking place. So I'm, what I'm going to do the first go back to Isaiah 11 for a moment and then I'll come back to uh, Isaiah chapter four. So the spirit of the Lord. So I'm going to write spirit. Of the Lord. All right. And mind you, my handwriting is not pretty, but we're just going to work it out right now. So it says the spirit of the Lord. And then it lists six, yay, seven characteristics of God's spirit. So the first one, the spirit of wisdom. And the other one was the spirit of understanding. Okay. Next one, the spirit of counsel. Okay. And the next one, the spirit of might. Next, the spirit of knowledge. And the next one, fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. So what you have here is a ascending chart, if you will, of the, the characteristics of the spirit of God. Then lastly, it is the spirit of judgment. Okay? These are the seven spirits, if you will, of God. You know, when you read in Revelation, it talks about the seven spirits of God. This is what it's referencing. You want to keep this in your notes somewhere. Okay? So you have a chiastic structure, a balance. So you have wisdom, one. Understanding, two. Counsel, three. Might, four. Knowledge, five. Fear of the Lord, six, judgment, seven. Okay? This is the fear or the spirit of the Lord manifested in seven different ways. So it's interesting. Again, Daniel has wisdom and understanding. An excellent, an excellent spirit is upon Daniel. Why? Because Daniel is connected with God. He has a vital connection, and the spirit of God is upon him, and he is living a life of power and influence. And my friends, you and I need to have this experience. I want to show you something else. You have your Bible. Open your Bible. Open your Bible to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. I want to show you something. The book of Proverbs, and again, I'm not studying the book of Proverbs with you right now, but the book of Proverbs is a practical manifestation of the Spirit of God on the life of a believer. So it's a very practical, pragmatic book on the experience of the people of God. And the reason why I say that, watch this. You're in Proverbs chapter one. Open your Bibles. Proverbs chapter one. And we're studying. All we're doing is studying, my friends. Nothing. We ain't got to be crazy. We ain't got to be scared of what's happening. We are in God's word. We are in fellowship with the most high. Watch what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter one, beginning at verse one. The Bible says. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know, what's it say? Wisdom mm. and instruction. To perceive the words of, what's it say? Understanding. Mm. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and what's it say? Judgment mm. and equity. To give subtility or subtle, sub, sub, to the simple, to the young man, knowledge. Mm, you guys see that? And dis discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise, what's it say? Counsels. 
So right now, my friends, just reading verses one through five, we've got wisdom, understanding, we have judgment, we have knowledge, we have counsel. Now watch. Wait, wisdom, understanding, judgment, knowledge, counsel. One, two, three, four, five. Look at verse number seven. Actually, we'll read verse six. It says, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, verse seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, what's it say? Knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So now we have the fear of the Lord. So the six of the seven key points that we see as from the spirit of the Lord are found in the first seven verses of Proverbs. You guys see that? And you can turn with me to Proverbs, I believe. Hold on one second. Proverbs, let me see here. I believe it's 8 verse 14. Let me just go there off the top of my head, see if I'm right. Yes. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 14. So Proverbs 8 verse 14 says, Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Now that word strength is the same as might. It's the same word in the Hebrew, the same exact word, same meaning. So when it's in Proverbs 8, it's talking about wisdom and wisdom being the personification of the character of God. And it's, it's saying that it has strength as part of its characteristics. So in the book of Proverbs, all seven of the characteristics of the spirit of the Lord are practically applied throughout the book. So as you read the book of Proverbs, it shows you how to live a God-fearing, spirit-filled life on a very real level. Now, why am I reading that? Because we're reading about Daniel and every many times as he is mentioned, he's mentioned as having the spirit of the Lord or the spirit of the Holy God or an excellent spirit is upon him or he has wisdom or he has counsel or he has understanding. God is on this man. And my friends, God should be upon us in great measure as well. Are you following? So we're not just reading this for the sake of reading this. We're reading this to say, Father, help me to live a life that is holy that is pure, that is righteous, that is spirit-filled. Why is it such a hard thing for Christians to know if they're spirit-filled spirit filled or spirit-led? It is not about having a funny feeling or speaking in tongues. It is about God's presence and his character being manifested in my life. So when someone looks at me and they are with me, they know that I've been with God and they should know that you have been with God and we should be praying more and more until our faces are on fire. I hope you understand what I'm saying when I say that. Until they would have known that we have been in the presence of Jesus. You know, when the disciples, after Jesus had died and gone back to heaven, and they listened to these men speak, they the the those persons around said, man, these people really were with Jesus. Because they were filled with the Spirit of God. They had the same connection. My friends, it is our challenge in these last hours of earth's history to be connected. I hope that's making sense to you. I, I, I'm hoping that's that's pragmatic to you. I want to show you something else. Let me come out of here. Let me, let me get out of here if I can get out of here. Maybe it doesn't want to get out of here. Hmm. Let me view options. Stop sharing. Okay. All right, very good. So let's come out of there. I want to go back to Daniel 4 for, with me for a moment. Back to Daniel 4. Let's see here, Ezekiel Daniel, Daniel 4. <laughs> All right. In Daniel 4, and we're just going to keep walking through the passage because there's so much more here. It says, watch this. Now, this is another part I loved about the story because I'm, I'm reading it through and I'm like, Brother Daniel was so wise. You'll see it says in verse number 10, it says, thus were the visions of my head 
in my bed. So now the king actually remembers his dream, right? So he's telling Daniel what, he's, what he dreamt. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bowls thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watch, a watcher, and a holy one came down from heaven. A watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Watch. He cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth and let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent. Now, why is this given to the intent? that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, what I didn't do, maybe I should do this right now. What I didn't do was look up that word basis. Now, if you can look up that word basis, that would be great. And if you can, if you know what that word basis of means, let me know. Type it in the chat. Let me know what you find as the basis of men. What, what does that mean? And I'm going to I'm looking it up right now. In fact, let me share my screen so I can show you how I look up, how I look up some things. All right. So let me share my screen with you. I'm going to share my first screen here. See, this is uh, this is Eastward. So I use Eastward. Uh, it's very it's a free a Bible app that you can download. I have in this one, I have a King James and I have a King James Plus. You can have other versions in there as well. And then I have all these dictionaries and stuff here. But I want to look up the word basis of men, right? That's what I'm looking for. And I'm looking at verse, what verse are we looking at? We read all the way down to verse 17. All right, so look at look at this, verse 17, basis of men. I want to look, type that word, boom. Here's the word. Oh, I skipped all the way down. Verse 17, basis. It means low. You guys see that? That's what that word means. It means low. So he puts in the lowest of men. So God is in charge. Essentially, at the end of the day, God is saying, I'm in charge. I am the one that's in control of all these things. I set up kings. I take them down. And I am the one that's put you in charge, Nebuchadnezzar, right? So... So watch this. Let's go back. Go back for a moment. Go back. Let's think. Let's think. You guys, because we're being Bible students right now. We, we are investigating the scriptures. So there's a vision of a tree, the leaves and the branches and the boughs and everything that's underneath this tree is being fed and taken care of by this tree. Now, I find that to be interesting. If you guys go outside when you can and you go out there and you look. There are certain animals that live under certain trees. Like the other day, we were, we were in the sunroom and we saw this beaver. And he was out there. He looked so cute, the little beaver out there. And he was just like, you know, like this. <laughs> he was out there and his, he was like doing a little attention, looking this way and that way. There's a beaver that lives over there and there's a little chipmunk. It's the same chipmunk. There's over right here. He burrows a little hole into the ground and he lives in the ground. And there's certain birds that fly over here all the time. There's certain trees. And so there's a, there's a habitat, if you will, of animals that live under certain trees and certain conditions. It's their little neighborhood, right? And so God is equating the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar to 
a large tree that grows. It didn't start out that big. It grew into a large tree. And there are many people and many persons influenced by him in his kingdom. Now, for a moment, I want you to think. Each of us are trees, right? You don't believe me? Hold your hold your hand right here in Daniel. I was not meaning to do this, but the verse came to my mind right now. So let's go there. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 30. Proverbs 11, verse number 30. Watch what the Bible says. In Proverbs 11, verse 30, the Bible says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Do you see that? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. So just like Nebuchadnezzar has been equated to a tree and all are living by this growth of the tree. So it is that we are trees in our own sense. And someone asks, what is the name of the Bible? The Bible application is called E Sword. Like E, the letter E, and then sword, and it's a free download, okay? So you definitely want to have it in your arsenal. If you, if you can put it on your computer, it's great to have, easy to use. And I'm going to use it more and more so I can show you guys how to use it. And when we do a word study or something, I can show you how to use it. Simple, simple, simple for the common man, which we all are. I'm a common person, so let's, let's do that. So I want to go back to this idea. Nebuchadnezzar has been equated to a tree and all these other creatures and all these other animals and all these things are benefited by this tree. And God himself has set this tree up and there's a watcher. What does that mean? A watcher? That means an angel. There, there, there are these beings that have jurisdiction and rulership and control and they come down and they make a proclamation. Cut down this tree, but leave the stump. It's going to be for a time. Now, let me show you something else here. I think we'll go back to Daniel 4. Go back to Daniel 4. And what I want to do, I'm going to share this, the, the Bible lesson that I organized for you guys on the screen here. And what I did, I like for me, the way I think, I try to see patterns. I usually see patterns. And what I try to do is let the Bible explain itself. I don't know if you do that yourself. I try not to make any assumptions to the best of my ability. I want the Bible to track for itself. And if I can see the Bible tracking for itself, I don't need to guess about anything, right? I don't need to be tricked by anybody either. So let me let me share my screen here and go back. And this time I'm going to bring up my document. Okay. You should be able to see my document here. This is my document. And you'll see there I have here... Dream, interpretation, and fulfillment. Do you guys see that? Dream, interpretation, and fulfillment. So the dream, I'll start reading. It's uh, The Bible verse is right here. It says, thus were the visions of my head, my bed, I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached into the heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth, the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all, the beasts of the field and the shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bowls thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. Okay, there's this tree. Daniel 4.22, this is the interpretation. Now, Daniel is interpreting. He's actually interpreting the dream or the vision. It says, it's, it says, it is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. You guys see that? So here, Daniel interprets the dream. He literally, this was his dream. Daniel says, you, king, are the one that has grown. Okay, you guys see that? Let's go a little bit further. It says, I saw in the visions of my head, Daniel 4, 13. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed and behold, a watcher. And an holy one come down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. OK, now this is the this is the interpretation. Here, Daniel is speaking in Daniel 425. That they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee 
to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. Now that word times, if you have a study Bible in the margins, it means years, or time means years. So seven times is seven years. That's all it's saying. Okay, nothing more. So seven times or seven years will pass over thee. Okay, let me let me read over here. The this is the fulfillment. Now this is after the king has had the vision. That he has had twelve months to think about what Daniel is telling him. In fact, let me come off of this for a second before I get to that. Let me come off of that. Open your open your Bible. Go back to Daniel four. Okay, I want you to see something else. Uh, and I want you to see something about Daniel's character uh, that I think is very, very apropos and powerful for any believer that wants to represent God in your daily life. Okay. Look at look at verse number 18. Okay, before I go into the interpretation, application fulfillment. Okay. Verse 18 says, This dream I Nebuchadnezzar have seen. Now thou, O Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able. Why? For the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Now, my friends, when I read this again today, I was like, the king knew he could have asked Daniel from the beginning, right? In the text, he literally says, I knew I knew you can answer this. I know everybody else can't answer it, but Daniel, I know you're the last one in here. I know you got the answer for me. There's no question in the king's mind that Daniel has the answer to his dream. Do you see that? Do you see any question there? Any hesitation? No. Daniel has proved himself over and over and over and over again in the king's court. And literally, the king says, Daniel, I know you have the, the interpretation. Brothers and sisters, we need to come to a place where people, when they look at us and they come to us with a question in regards to God, there should be no question in their mind. I know you guys got the answer. I, I know you have the answer to this question. Because why? Not because you're smart, but because the spirit of the Holy Ghost is upon thee. Are you following what I'm saying, my friends? This is powerful. Daniel's character is so powerful, so strong, that he just walks in. The king knows, I know you can do this. I'm going to tell you the dream. I know you got this. I know everybody else don't got it, but I know you have it because there's something special about you. Watch this. Verse 19. Now watch Daniel. Now I found this to be so powerful, my friends. Watch Daniel. Because this, this is something else. And again, the casual reader will miss this. Okay? Don't be a casual reader when you study the Bible. Watch this. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Now, friends, hear me when I say this to you, man. There are so many people that want to be right, that when they are right, they bludgeon and beat down the ones that are wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? Daniel literally knows the interpretation from the beginning. He knew he didn't have to take an hour. He's literally, he's astonished. He's thinking, man, I don't want to say this. This is not good news. This is not something I want to say. This is not something I want to build my ministry off of. You, you follow what I'm saying? Like, this is troubling him so much so that he said, I don't want to say this. I, I, this, this be to those who hate you, man. I don't, want to, I, don't have to, I don't want to have to repeat this. And some of us, my friends, are too anxious to expose the sins and the downfall of others as a means of advancing whatever cause we think we're advancing. When this man of God who is full of the spirit of God it troubles him to have to say anything, but he's going to have to say it, right? You can't hide it, there's, but there's no glee in his voice like, ha ha, you, you arrogant man, you will now be punished. <laughs> That's not what happens. He literally, for an hour, doesn't say anything. The king himself has to prod him and say, look, Daniel, look, man, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Just say it, man. I, I'm not going to do anything to you. Everything's going to be fine. You know, I, I was looking at this passage and a couple of verses came to my attention. And I want to run these passages by you. Okay, so make sure you keep these in your, your arsenal. Proverbs chapter 29. Tom's Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 29. And we're looking at verse 20. Okay. Proverbs 29 and verse 20. And again, remember the book of Proverbs is this wise counsel of, of practical, practical spirit-filled living. Okay. In Proverbs 29, 20, the Bible says, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words there is more hope of a fool than of him mm. i'll read it again see is thou a man that is hasty in his words there is more hope of a fool than of him in other words think before you speak take your time in communicating especially with your loved ones right Husband and wife, you're having a conversation. You just feel like you got to say anything. You can say whatever you want, and then you say it, and then boom, you, you have an argument, and there's this division. Or you in church, and there's a sensitive issue that's going on. You're just like, look, I'm just going to let them know. I'm going to let them have it. Boom, you say it. Hasty words. There's more hope for a fool than a person that has hasty words, my friends. James, James chapter 1. Go to James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and we're looking at verse number 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I'll read it again. James 1, 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. You see, a spirit-filled man or a spirit-filled sister will be able to control their tongue. And the only way you can control your tongue is if your heart has been tamed and controlled by God's spirit. Go back with me to the book of Proverbs. Go back to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10, looking at verse 19, Proverbs 10, verse 19, watch what the Bible says. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, mm. but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Hmm. You guys see that? In a multitude of world, words, there is sin. Inevitably, people talk, 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 talk. Somehow pride is going to come out. Somehow some false side fib is going to come out. There's too much talking going on. Words, 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 words. But a man who refrains his lips, this one, pay attention to that one. It's a wise man. It's a wise woman. Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You see how practical the, the, the prophecy stories are? You, you go through them, you're like, hey, I didn't see that before. I didn't know that was there. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Look at this. Beginning at verse 1. And I'm going to, okay, here it is. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. Mm. So even when speaking to God, careful what you say. Don't be rash in how you approach him. And if that's an approach towards God, how much more our approach to our brothers and sisters? Right? There is wisdom in keeping the tongue. James talks about the tongue being a little fire. 
and he that brighteth his tongue brighteth his whole body. Proverbs. Back to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17. Now, this one is the is the cream on top of the cake. It could be the cake itself. I love this passage, brothers and sisters. In Proverbs chapter 17, and we're looking at verse 28. Watch what the Bible says. Proverbs 17, verse 20. Verse, actually, start at verse 27. Proverbs 17 and verse 27, the Bible says, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of, and what's it say? Excellent spirit. Uh, did you see that? So remember, we were reading about Daniel and the king and all the leadership are like, he is a man of an excellent spirit, which means what? He has understanding. That means he knows how to keep his tongue. Watch what else it says. He that have knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So what did we read? Daniel says nothing for an hour. He could have said it right away, didn't say anything. Quiet, silence. And Daniel is a wise man. He's an intelligent man. He's a man after God's own heart. He is full of the spirit of God. Practical application, brothers and sisters. Go back to Daniel now. Back to Daniel. Daniel 4. All right. We're making our way. Back to Daniel 4. Now watch this. And we're looking at Daniel 4, and we are perusing to verse number. Actually, let's go back to the screen because we're in Daniel 4. I, I want to share my screen on this one. Let's go here. Let's see if I can do that. Share my screen. All right. So now, now Daniel goes through, begins to... Share and interpret the dream. So we already did the first part. Let's go to the second part here. You see here, first column is the dream. Second column is the interpretation. Third column is the fulfillment. Okay? So it says, I saw, verse 13 of Daniel 4, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree. Cut off his branches, take off his leaves, scatter his fruits, let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. That's what the watcher said. Go to verse 25. This is Daniel interpreting this section of the vision. It says, And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. Watch what it says in verse 31. Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, now this is the application. So in verse 14 was the vision. In verse 25, Daniel was explaining that this is going to happen to you. But verse 31 is the actual application where it says, O king. Nebuchadnezzar, a voice from heaven says, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and, they, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, seven times shall pass over thee. Now pause. You know the interesting part about this? That as the voice comes down from heaven, it still calls him king. Do you guys see that? The voice comes from heaven and doesn't just call him Nebuchadnezzar because he could have did that, right? He could have just said, Nebuchadnezzar, your time is up. But the voice from heaven still respected him enough to call him king. <laughs> it's just an observation, right? Still respected him enough to call him king, but then tells him this is, this, is, this is going down right now, okay? This is happening right now. Go back to verse, verse number 15 of Daniel 4. Go back to verse 15 of Daniel 4. Notice, it says, nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, 
even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. A couple of observations. There's a declaration that he's going to be made in like an animal or like a beast. However, the roots, the roots of his kingdom are still going to be in place. Okay. They're not going to be taken away. They're still going to be there. The other observation I thought was interesting, where it says, let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. Uh, we haven't got to Daniel chapter seven yet, but when you get to Daniel seven, the first kingdom is a lion and it has a, and it raises itself on two hind legs, right? And it's standing there and the lion's heart is taken out of him and a man's heart is given unto the beast, okay? So I thought that was interesting that this is the inverse or the opposite transpiring here in the experience of Daniel. Okay, let's go a little bit further with this. You'll see that the stump is left in the ground, right? In the, in the roots of the earth, even with the band of iron and brass. And then it says, uh, go, to, go to, to the second column, the interpretation, right? Looking at verse 26. Now, Dan Daniel was speaking in verse 26. It says, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the trees, stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. So your kingdom is going to be left unto you. And then after you're going through this process, you're going to recognize that the heavens do rule. And I should have put that in a different color. It should have matched the other white and blue that we have here. You see this? It says, uh, verse 25, till thou know that the most high ruteth in the kingdom of men. And giveth it to whomsoever he will. Again, this idea is very simple. God is saying you're going to be in this condition until there's an acknowledgement of the Most High. And now, in, ver in the column number three, verse 32, look at what happens. This is the actual application. The voice from heaven is speaking, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass thee, pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So you'll notice, he gets this message one time by God himself. He gets it the second time through Daniel. He gets it a third time, not in a vision or a dream and not through a prophet, but now directly from God himself speaks to him and tells him the exact same thing. And then verse 33 says, the same hour was the thing fulfilled unto Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles feathers and his nails like birds Claws. Brothers and sisters, my man went crazy. Can you imagine that happening to you? Put yourself in that form. Like, imagine yourself in that situation. And then I want you to think, man, God had to go to that level <laughs> to bring Nebuchadnezzar to a place where he would be converted. Do you understand what I'm saying? God literally took him on a raw diet, made him eat like other animals and creatures eat. And this man turns from a man to a beast. Now, why does God do this? Stay with me. Stay with me now because we're, we're coming to a point of application. God literally turns this man to a beast for the sake of winning him. Okay? For the sake of winning him. In my mind, I'm like, what level does God have to bring me to to be completely submitted to what he wants in my life? Like that, to me, that's the question. Like, what does God have to do to say, Andre, Andre, Andre? Does he have to shake him? Does he have to shake my life up altogether? Does he have to turn me into a beast? Now, why is such a drastic, drastic thing for him? You know why? You know why this happened to him? Because his pride was so high. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty look before fall. 
You remember he's standing there and he says, is this not great Babylon, which I have built for my glory? He stands there and he takes to himself glory, which alone belongs to God. God is the one that gave him this kingdom. He's the one that set it up and he's the one that took it down. Now, my friends, the extreme measures to which God had to communicate this to him. Think about it. God literally takes the captive of Israel or Judah and raises this captive up in his court. God literally gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream and shows him clearly that he's the one that's in charge. God is the one that's in charge. He's the one that sets up kingdoms and takes them down. And then in chapter three, he literally defines God, builds a golden image, and then God himself comes down in the midst of the fire with his chosen children. And this king in chapter four still stands there and says, is this not great Babylon, which I built for my glory? You say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, what a fool you are, Nebuchadnezzar. I can't believe Nebuchadnezzar. And then I say to you, my friends, what about the fool that we are? Huh? How much has God done for us? How many times has God gone above and beyond to save us from ourselves? How many times has he come through? How many times has he blessed us? And then at the end of the day, we're just like the children of Israel, complaining and complaining and complaining and turning our backs on God and just doing what we want to do. And God is there trying to get our attention. And my friends, if he has to, I pray it never has to happen to me. And I pray it never has to happen to you. But by any means necessary, Father. Please save us. Huh? Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be lost. And I know you don't want to be lost. And all these wonderful promises and blessings that God has provided for his children, why would we be lost? Lest we forget. God has gone to extreme measures to speak to this man, to remind him of what he is. We are nothing, brothers and sisters, without God. There is no glory to be taken to ourselves. It doesn't even make any sense to be like, oh, I'm such a good person. Oh, I've done this and done that. Doesn't make any sense to do that. We are indebted to the most high. Notice. Notice what the Bible says. And, I, and I'm going to go. Let me let me stop sharing the screen. Let me let's open our Bibles back. Go back with me for a second. Now, I want you to go back with me. Look at this. We're in Daniel four. Look at verse number. 34, okay? Daniel 4, we're looking at verse 34. Notice what the Bible says. It says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. So now his, his cognitive abilities comes back to him because God himself gave it back to him, right? And he's acknowledging the most high. He's praising the most high. He's giving glory to the most high. Then it says in verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. Come on now. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Mm. What, what doest thou? Couldn't come, couldn't come to that by himself. He literally had to be humbled into an animal form to recognize the creator's potency and power. I wonder, can we acknowledge, here's, here's, let's be, I want to be 100 with you, okay? There are some things that we know intellectually, like mental ascent to information. Like we read it and we're like, yeah, that makes sense. But there are other things that, as far as this text is concerned, mental ascent is not enough. I must now put my, my heart and my mind and my soul in dependence upon this reality. That he is the one that rules the most high. That he is the one that commands the armies of heaven. That he is the one that spoke 
everything into existence, that he is the one that sets up kings and he takes them down. He is the one that's in charge, not who's in office right now, not these kings of the earth that are present now. The God of the universe is in charge. So I care not what you and other people are trying to do. I need to make sure that I need to be with Jesus and in his plan and in his organization. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm hoping that makes sense. Because if that makes sense, my friends, then our faith and our hope and our trust is not in ourselves. And our hope and our faith and our trust is not in our churches. Our faith and our hope and our trust is not in our friends or our family. Our faith and our hope and our trust is in the Most High. And as you and I trust in Him, then, brothers and sisters, then, my friends, we can live a life that is vibrant and powerful and faithful to God. But without doing that, we're just lip service. The kings of the earth will never know what the truth is because we, as God's children, are not representing that and giving glory to God in how we're living and how we're talking and how we're treating each other and how we love each other. But how can you love if you don't know the God of love? How can you give glory if you don't know the God of glory? How can you have peace if you've never met the Prince of Peace? Nebuchadnezzar has these intimate encounters with God, and when he's done with it, listen to what he says. Watch, watch this. Listen to what he says. He says, I want to read verse 35 again. It says, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? At the same time, I reason, return unto me, and, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness, return unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now, this is him acknowledging the reality of the fulfillment of what God said was going to happen anyway. Now, watch verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. You hear that? All who walk in pride, he is able to abase. Who's giving this testimony? The king of Babylon, come on now. The king of Babylon is giving this testimony. The king of Babylon is acknowledging the reality. Look, I was proud. And I'm not ashamed to tell you, I ate some grass for seven years. My hair grew out like feathers. <laughs> my fingernails grew like bird's claws. Until reason settled in my mind. And I acknowledged the reality of the king of kings and lord of lords. Come on. You know. There's a there's a message. It's found in Revelation chapter 14. And I know some of you know this already. Some of you don't know what I'm going to read right now, but I'm going to read it to you. And I want you to realize that Nebuchadnezzar is actually proclaiming the first angel's message. In Revelation chapter 14, the Bible says in beginning at verse six. And in fact, yeah, in verse six, it says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice. What does he say with a loud voice? Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Nebuchadnezzar said essentially the same thing. He said, look. This kingdom that I thought I built myself, nope, the God of heaven did that. The God of heaven put judgment on me. The God of heaven is the one that restored me to my place of position and power and influence. The God of heaven is the one that's in charge of all things. He is the one that sits on the throne and rules over the nations of men. And if one is proud, he is able to abase them, my friends. Nebuchadnezzar said the same thing. In fact, let me show you this. I, you know, it's just the, it's the way I study. So one of the things I did here. You see this? First angel's message. So an angel is simply a messenger. Okay. 
An angel is simply a messenger, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel preached on them. We just read that. You see Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar the, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto what? All people, nations, and languages that dwell where? In the earth. Go back to the first angel. That it, the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwelled on the what? Dwell on the earth. Now, the gospel, again, we haven't gone into what the word gospel means. The, gospel, the word gospel means good news. The effect of the gospel, the effect of good news is peace. Nebuchadnezzar literally says, peace be multiplied unto you. That peace comes from the gospel, my friends. Nebuchadnezzar is preaching the gospel. And then it says, another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Who's, who's the messenger in this passage? That's Nebuchadnezzar. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God had wrought toward me. How great are his signs. And how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. What is that saying? Simply saying, my friends, a simple concept. He's giving glory to God. Then it says, Nai al Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the kingdom of heaven, the king of heaven. What is praise and extol and honor? That's worship. And then it says, all those work, all whose works are truth and his ways are judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. That's fearing God. He recognizes the greatness of God and he recognizes the smallness of what he is. Nebuchadnezzar is preaching the first angel's message in principle. In principle. So my friends, I, I just have a question. I want to end this. I have a question. Does God have full, complete control in your life? Are there areas in your life where God has literally said, leave that alone? Give that to me. Are there places in your experience where the Most High has cried out to you in vision or in dream or by prophet? or by teacher, or by pastor, or by child? Has he cried out to you some way, shape, or form? I don't know how he speaks to you on a regular basis, but I'm asking you, is he pleading with you? And in, in this story, there is a limit to which God, God is willing to go. He, like, he can turn you to an animal if he needs to, but my friends, why go to that extent? Like, why, why make it so hard? Why make it so hard? Why not just surrender? Now, the easiest way to do it, I'm going to tell you a secret. And this is the secret. If you learn this secret, everything else is going to be extremely simple to you. So here's the secret. As the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there's awakened in the soul the mysterious power of faith, adoration, and love. Upon the vision of Christ, the gaze is fixed and the beholder grows into the likeness of that which he adores. Well, that's interesting. If you behold Christ, you become like Christ. But if you behold beast or creation of man and you worship beast and idols, you become a beast. You must fix your eyes on Jesus. And the amazing thing is, as you fix your eyes on him, he creates something in you that is not naturally there, which is love, adoration. You, you, don't, you don't have that naturally. That's not something that just emanates from us. We are broken people. We have issues. Like, we're crazy. Really, we are. We are. You can be like, I'm not. Yes, we are. Without God, we are nothing. It's only by Christ that we have a stable mind. It's only by Christ that we are what we are. And there's another level that he's calling us to. I know there's another level he's calling me to. So if you, won't, if you don't mind, let's bow our heads together. Let's ask God to help us see Jesus, to help us grow, to be more like him, to be full, like Daniel was, of the Holy Spirit, so that when men and women encounter us, they will know that we have been with the Most High. If that's your desire, let's bow, bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, just want to thank you for the time that we've had to study. Lord, the time has gone so fast, but your word is so good. Father, I ask, Lord, that you teach us to, to have these words 
hidden in our hearts, the reality that you desire to dwell in us, that these temples can be an abiding place for your Holy Spirit. Father, please, please, for those that are listening, Father, those who are listening tonight, those who will listen in the future, please, please help us. We can't do this without you. There's nothing hid from your eyes. We pray this in the name of Jesus and we claim the merits of his holy and most precious blood. Amen. All right, my friends, thank you for jumping on tonight. Uh, again, feel free to share this with as many people as possible. Um, you can feel free to download our podcast. Our podcast is called The Gospelpreneur. Um, so feel free to download the podcast, share it with your friends and family. Thank you so much. Please keep us in prayer. You guys have a blessed evening. Mira nothing.